Chapter 9, An Evening at Four Winds Point It was late September when Anne and Gilbert were able to pay the Four Winds Light their promised visit. They had often planned to go, but something had always occurred to prevent them. Captain Jim had dropped in several times at the little house. I don't stand on ceremony, Mistress Blythe, he told Anne. It's a real pleasure to me to come here, and I'm not going to deny myself just because you haven't got down to see me. There oughtn't to be no bargaining like that among the race that knows Joseph. I'll come when I can, and you come when you can. And as so long as we have our pleasant little chat, it doesn't matter a mite what roof is over us. Captain Jim took a great fancy to Gog and Magog, who were presiding over the destinies of the hearth in the little house with as much dignity and aplomb as they had done at Patty's place. Aren't they the cutest little cusses, he would say delightedly. And he bade them greeting and farewell as gravely and invariably as he did his host and hostess. Captain Jim was not going to offend household deities by any lack of reverence and ceremony. You've made this little house just about perfect, he told Anne. It was never so nice before. Mr. Selwyn had your taste, and she did wonders. But folks in those days didn't have the pretty little curtains and pictures and knickknacks you have. As for Elizabeth, she lived in the past. You've kinder brought the future into it, so to speak. I'd be real happy even if we couldn't talk at all when I come here. Just to sit and look at you and your pictures and your flowers would be enough of a treat. It's beautiful, beautiful. Captain Jim was a passionate worshipper of beauty. Every lovely thing heard or seen gave him a deep, subtle inner joy that irradiated his life. He was quite keenly aware of his own lack of outward comeliness and lamented it. Folks say I'm good he remarked whimsically upon one occasion, but I sometimes wish the Lord had made me only half as good and put the rest of it into looks. But there, I reckon he knew what he was about, as a good captain should. Some of us have to be homely, or the purty ones like Mistress Blythe here wouldn't show up so well. One evening, Anne and Gilbert finally walked down to the Four Winds Light. The day had begun somberly in grey cloud and mist but it had ended up in a pomp of scarlet and gold. Over the western hills beyond the harbour were amber deeps and crystalline shallows, with the fire of sunset below. The north was a mackerel sky of little fiery golden clouds. The red light flamed on the white sails of a vessel gliding down the channel, bound to a southern port in a land of palms. Beyond her, it smote upon and incarnadine the shining white, grassless faces of the sand dunes. To the right, it fell on the old house among the willows up the brook, and gave it for a fleeting space casements more splendid than those of an old cathedral. They glowed out of its quiet grayness like the throbbing blood-red thoughts of a vivid soul imprisoned in a dull husk of environment. That old house up the brook always seems so lonely, said Anne. I never see visitors there. Of course, its lane opens on the upper road, but I don't think there's much coming and going. It seems odd we've never met the Moors yet, when we live within fifteen minutes walk of us. I may have seen them in church, of course, but if so, I don't know them. I'm sorry they're so unsociable when there are only near neighbors. Evidently, they don't belong to the race that knows Joseph laughed Gilbert. Have you ever found out who that girl was whom you thought so beautiful? No. Somehow, I've never remembered to ask about her, but I've never seen her anywhere, so I suppose she must have been a stranger. Oh, the sun has just vanished, and there's the light. As the dusk deepened, the great beacon cut swaths of light through it, sweeping in a circle over the fields and the harbour, the sandbar and the gulf. I feel as if it might catch me and whisk me leagues out to sea, said Anne, as one drenched them with radiance, and she felt rather relieved when they got so near the point that they were inside the range of those dazzling recurrent flashes. As they turned into the little lane that led across the fields to the point, they met a young man coming out of it, a man of such extraordinary appearance that for a moment they both frankly stared. He was a decided fine-looking person, 
tall, broad shoulder, well featured with a Roman nose and frank gray eyes. He was dressed in a prosperous farmer's Sunday best. In so far, he might have been any inhabitant of a Four Winds or the Glen. But flowing over his breast nearly to his knees was a river of crinkly brown beard, and adown his back beneath his commonplace felt hat was a corresponding cascade of thick, wavy brown hair. Anne, murmured Gilbert, when they were out of earshot. You didn't put what Uncle Dave calls a little Scott act in that lemonade you gave me before we left home, did you? No, I didn't, said Anne, stifling her laughter, lest the retreating enigma should hear her. Who in the world can he be? I don't know, but if Captain Jim keeps apparitions like that, down at this point I'm going to carry cold iron in my pocket when I come here. He wasn't a sailor, or one might pardon his eccentricity of appearance. He must belong to the over-harbor clans. Uncle Dave says they have several freaks over there. Uncle Dave is a little prejudiced, I think. You know all the over-harbor people who come to the Glen Church seem very nice. Oh, Gilbert, isn't this beautiful? The Four Winds Light was built on a spur of red sandstone cliff jutting out into the gulf. On one side, across the channel, stretched the silvery sand shore of the bar. On the other, extended a long, curving beach of red cliffs, rising steeply from the pebbled coves. It was a shore that knew the magic and mystery of storm and star. There is a great solitude about such a shore. The woods are never solitary. They are full of whispering, beckoning, friendly life. But the sea is a mighty soul forever moaning of some great unshareable sorrow, which shuts it up into itself for all eternity. We can never pierce its infinite mystery. We may only wander, awed and spellbound, on the outer fringe of it. The woods call to us with a hundred voices, but the sea has one only, a mighty voice that drowns our souls in its majestic music. The woods are human, but the sea is of the company of the archangels. Anne and Gilbert found Uncle Jim sitting on a bench outside the lighthouse, putting the finishing touches to a wonderful full-rigged toy schooner. He rose and welcomed them to his abode with the gentle unconscious courtesy that became him so well. This has been a pretty nice day all through, Mistress Blythe, and now, right at the last, it's brought the best. Would you like to sit down here outside a bit while the light lasts? I've just finished this bit of plaything for my little grandnephew Joe up at the Glen. After I promised to make it for him, I was kind of sorry for his mother was vexed. She's afraid he'll want to go to sea later on, and she doesn't want the notion encouraged in him. But what could I do, Mr. Splythe? I promised him, and I think it's sort of real dastardly to break a promise you make to a child. Come and sit down. It won't take long to stay an hour. The wind was offshore and only broke the sea's surface into long silvery ripples and sent sheeny shadows flying out across it, from every point and headland like transparent wings. The dusk was hanging a curtain of violet gloom over the sand dunes and the headlands where gulls were huddling. The sky was faintly filmed over with scarves of silken vapor. Cloud fleets rode at anchor along the horizons. An evening star was watching over the bar. Isn't that a view worth looking at? said Uncle Jim with a loving proprietary pride. Nice and far from the marketplace, ain't it? No buying and selling and getting gain. You don't have to pay anything. All that sea and sky, free, without money and without price. There's going to be a moonrise pretty soon. Too. I'm never tired of finding out what a moonrise can be over them rocks and sea and harbor. There's a surprise in it every time. They had their moonrise and watched its marvel and magic in the silence that asked nothing of the world or each other. Then they went up into the tower and Captain Jim showed and explained the mechanism of the great light. Finally, they found themselves in the dining room where a fire of driftwood was weaving flames of wavering, elusive, sea-borne hues in the open fireplace. "'I put this fireplace in myself,' remarked Captain Jim. 
The government don't give lighthouse keepers such luxuries. Look at the colors that wood makes. If you'd like some driftwood for your fire, Mistress Blythe, I'll bring you up a load some day. Sit down, I'm going to make you a cup of tea. Captain Jim placed a chair for Anne, having first removed therefrom a huge orange-colored cat and a newspaper. Get down, matey. The sofa is your place. I must put this paper away safe till I can find time to finish the story in it. It's called A Mad Love. Tisn't my favorite brand of fiction, but I'm reading it just to see how long she can spin it out. It's at the 62nd chapter now, and the wedding ain't nearer than it was when it begun as far as I can see. When little Joe comes, I have to read him pirate yarns. Ain't it strange how innocent little creatures like children like the bloodthirstiest stories? Like my Davy at home, said Anne. He wants tales that reek with gore. Captain Jim's tea proved to be nectar. He was pleased as a child with Anne's compliments, but he affected a fine indifference. The secret is I don't skimp the cream. He remarked airily. Captain Jim had never heard of Oliver Wendell Holmes, but he evidently agreed with that writer's dictum, Big Heart never liked Little Cream Pot. We met an odd-looking personage coming out of your lane, said Gilbert as they sipped. Who was he? Captain Jim grinned. That's Marshall Elliot, a mighty fine man with just one streak of foolishness in him. I suppose you wondered what his object was in turning himself into a sort of dime museum freak. Is he a modern Nazarite or a Hebrew prophet left over from the old times? asked Anne. Neither of them. It's politics and that's the bottom of his freak. All those Elliots and Crawfords and McAllisters are dyed in the wool politicians. They're born grit or Tory as the case may be and they live grit or Tory as they die grit or Tory. And what they're going to do in heaven where there's probably no politics is more than I can fathom. This Marshall Elliot was a born grit. I'm a grit myself in moderation, but there's no moderation about Marshall. Fifteen years ago, there was a specially bitter general election. Marshall fought for his party tooth and nail. He was dead sure the liberals would win. So sure, he got up at a public meeting and vowed that he wouldn't shave his face or cut his hair until the grits were in power. Well, they didn't go in. And they never got in yet. And you saw the result today for yourselves. Marshall stuck to his word. What does his wife think of it? Asked Anne. He's a bachelor. But if he had a wife, I reckon she wouldn't make him break that vow. That family of Elliot's always been more stubborn than natural. Marshall's brother Alexander had a dog he set great store by, and when it died, the man actually wanted to have it buried in the graveyard, along with the other Christians, he said. Of course, he wasn't allowed to, so he buried it just outside the graveyard fence and never darkened the church door again. But Sundays, he'd drive his family to church and sit by the dog's grave and read his Bible all the time the service was going on. They say when he was dying, he asked his wife to bury him beside the dog. She was a meek little soul, but she fired up at that. She said she wasn't going to be buried beside no dog, and if he'd rather have his last resting place beside the dog than beside her, just to say so. Alexander Elliot was a stubborn mule, but he was fond of his wife, so he gave in and said, Well, darn it, bury me where you please. But when Gabriel's trump blows, I expect my dog to rise with the rest of us. For he had as much soul as any derned Elliot or Crawford or McAllister that ever strutted. Them was his parting words. As for Marshall, we're all used to him, but he must strike strangers as right down peculiar looking. I've known him ever since he was ten. He's about fifty now, and I like him. Him and me was out cod fishing today. That's about all I'm good at for now catching trout and cod occasional. But twer'n't always so, not by no matter of means. I used to do other things, as you'd admit, if you saw my life book. Anne was just going to ask what his life book was when the first mate created a diversion by springing upon Captain Jim's knee. He was a gorgeous beastie, with a face as round as a full moon, vivid green eyes, and immense white double paws. Captain Jim stroked his velvet back gently. 
I never fancied cats much until I found the first mate, he remarked to the accompaniment of the mate's tremendous purrs. I saved his life, and when you've saved a creature's life, you're bound to love it. It's next thing to give in life. There's some terrible thoughtless people in the world, Mistress Blythe. Some of them city folks who have summer homes over in the harbor are so thoughtless, they're cruel. It's the worst kind of cruelty, the thoughtless kind. You can't cope with it. They keep cats there in the summer and feed and pet them and doll them up with ribbons and collars, and then in the fall they go off and leave them to starve or freeze. It makes my blood boil, Mistress Blythe. One day last winter, I found a poor old mother cat dead on the shore lying next to the skin and bone bodies of her three little kittens. She died, she died trying to shelter them. She had her poor stiff paws around them. Master, I cried. Then I swore. Then I carried them poor kittens home and fed them up and found good homes for them. I knew the woman who left the cat, and when she came back this summer, I just went over the harbor and told her my opinion of her. It was rank meddling, but I do love meddling in a good cause. How did she take it? asked Gilbert. Cried and said she didn't think. I says to her, says I, do you suppose that'll be held for a good excuse in the day of judgment? When you'll have to account for that poor old mother's life? The Lord will ask you what he give you your brains for if it wasn't to think, I reckon. I don't fancy she'll leave cats to starve another time. Was the first mate one of the forsaken? Asked Anne, making advances to him, which were responded to graciously, if condescendingly. Yes, I found him one bitter cold day in winter, caught in the branches of a tree by his dern fool ribbon collar. He was almost starving. If you could have seen his eyes, Mistress Blythe, he was nothing but a kitten, and he got his living somehow since he'd been left until he got hung up. When I loosed him, he gave my hand a pitiful swipe with his little red tongue. He wasn't the able seaman you see now. He was meek as Moses. That was nine years ago. His life has been long in the land for a cat. He's a good old pal, the first mate is. I should have expected you to have a dog, said Gilbert. Captain Jim shook his head. I had a dog once. I thought so much of him that when he died, I couldn't bear the thought of getting another in his place. He was a friend, you understand, Mistress Blythe. Matey's only a pal. I'm fond of Matey. All the fonder on account of the spice of devilment that's in him like there is in all cats, but I loved my dog. I always had a sneaking sympathy for Alexander Elliot about his dog. There isn't any devil in a good dog. That's why they're more lovable than cats, I reckon. But I'm darned if they're as interesting. Here I am talking too much. Why don't you check me? When I do get a chance to talk to anyone, I run on terrible. If you've done your tea, I've a few little things you might like to look at. Picked them up in the queer corners I used to be poking my nose into. Captain Jim's few little things turned out to be a most interesting collection of curios, hideous, quaint, and beautiful, and almost every one had some striking story attached to it. Anne never forgot the delight with which she listened to those old tales that moonlit evening by that enchanted driftwood fire while the silver sea called to them through the open window and sobbed against the rocks below them. Captain Jim never said a boastful word, but it was impossible to help seeing what a hero the man had been. Brave, true, resourceful, unselfish. He sat there in his little room and made those things live again for his hearers. By a lift of the eyebrow, a twist of the lip, a gesture, a word, he painted a whole scene or character so that they saw it as it was. Some of Captain Jim's adventures had such a marvelous edge that Anne and Gilbert secretly wondered if he were not drawing a rather long bow at their credulous expense. But in this, as they found later, they did him an injustice. His tales were all literally true. Captain Jim had the gift of the born storyteller, whereby unhappy far-off things can be brought vividly before the hearer in their all their pristine poignancy. 
Anne and Gilbert laughed and shivered over his tales, and once Anne found herself crying. Captain Jim surveyed her tears with pleasure shining from his face. I like to see folks cry that way, he remarked. It's a compliment, but I can't do justice to the things I've seen or helped to do. I've them all jotted down in my life book, but I haven't got the knack of writing them out properly. If I could hit on just the right words and string them together proper on paper, I could make a great book. It would beat a mad love holler, and I believe Joe would like it as well as the pirate yarns. Yes, I've had some adventures in my time, and do you know, Mistress Blythe, I still lust after them. Yes, old and useless as I be, there's an awful longing sweeps over me at times to sail out, out, out there, forever and ever. Like Ulysses, you would sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until you die, said Anne dreamily. Ulysses? I've read of him. Yes, that's just how I feel. Just how all us old sailors feel, I reckon. I'll die on land after all, I suppose. Well, what is to be will be. There was old William Ford at the Glen who never went on the water in his life because he was afraid of being drowned. A fortune teller had predicted he would be, and one day he fainted and fell with his face in the barn trough and was drowned. Must you go? Well, come soon and come often. The doctor is to do the talking next time. He knows a heap of things I want to find out. I'm sort of lonesome here by times. It's been worse since Elizabeth Russell died. Her and me was such cronies. Captain Jim spoke with the pathos of the aged who see their old friends slipping from them one by one. Friends whose place can never be quite filled by those of a younger generation, even of the race that knows Joseph. Anne and Gilbert promised to come soon and often. He's a rare old fellow, isn't he? said Gilbert as they walked home. Somehow I cannot reconcile his simple, kindly personality with the wild, adventurous life he has lived, mused Anne. You wouldn't find it so hard if you'd seen him the other day down at the fishing village. One of the men of Peter Gautier's boat made a nasty remark about some girl along the shore. Captain Jim fairly scorched the wretched fellow with the lightning of his eyes. He seemed a man transformed. He didn't say much. The way he said it. You'd have thought it would strip the flesh from the fellow's bones. I understand that Captain Jim will never allow a word against any woman to be said in his presence. I wonder why he never married, said Anne. He should have sons with their ships at sea now and grandchildren climbing all over him to hear his stories. He's that kind of man. Instead, he is nothing but a magnificent cat. But Anne was mistaken. Captain Jim had more than that. He had a memory. <laughs>